Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Today we'll read from a book titled Modern Instances, The Craft of Photography, a memoir by Stephen Shore, published by Mac. Modern Instances is a subjective scrapbook of thoughts and impressions, an impressionistic memoir. Writing this book has given me the impetus to reflect on the people, events and works of art that have impacted me and on how those impacts have been assimilated. A number of the most significant photographers of my generation have shown a reticence to articulate their intentions. Robert Adams summed this up in his book Why People Photograph. Part of the reason that these attempts at explanation fail, I think, is that photographers, like all artists, choose their medium because it allows them the most fully truthful expression of their vision. As Robert Frost told the person who asked him what one of his poems meant, you want me to say it worse? Robert Adams was part of a group show in Venice in 1987, in which I participated along with Louis Baltz, Bill Eggleston and John Gossage. Adams didn't make the trip to Italy, but the rest of us took part in public discussion. Baltz and Gossage spoke with their usual eloquence. When it was Eggleston's turn, he said, slowly in his southern drawl, I think... I think I will just uh, show my work and not say anything, as though the thought had just occurred to him, as though he might, on another occasion, have much to say. Actually, there was one occasion more than a decade earlier that was particularly memorable. The first time Bill showed any of his work in New York was at a talk he gave at the International Center of Photography in 1974. He projected his original Kodachrome transparencies. He didn't say much about his pictures and was unresponsive to most questions from the audience. Then someone asked him, could you look at one of your pictures and free associate? Bill turned and looked at the slide being projected, a picture of a hound lapping at a muddy puddle, and said, bridge over troubled water. He didn't want to answer questions about his equipment or his images meanings, but when someone asked him something that he felt was real, well, that interested him. This event must have left a mark on Bill as well, because six years later he named a portfolio Troubled Waters. Not long after that evening, Lee Friedlander shows slides of his American Monument series in the Great Hall at Cooper Union. It was the first time he showed this work. He didn't talk about the pictures, and one could tell that the audience, largely students who are used to analyzing their work in class every week, were getting restless. Finally, someone raised their hand and asked, What were you feeling when you took this picture? Friedlander replied, as I recall, I was hungry. Like those students at Cooper Union, I too go to class every week. I have been the director of the photography program at Bard College since 1982. I see my role in the classroom as that of a guide, leading each student to find their voice as an artist. I see myself as much a teacher as a photographer, when I am asked to give a public talk about my work, I think about how what I say about my pictures or my life can become a teaching situation. This may grow out of my instinct as a photographer to find the universal in the particular. I agree with Bob Adams that there are aspects of a photograph that can't be expressed more clearly than the photograph itself. And throughout this book, I have let photographs, paintings and poems speak for themselves, rather than try to say it worse. But I also know that there's much that can be expressed and digested. This book reflects on the process of internalizing a discipline and the place of that process in the arc of a creative drive. Encounters I have realized to what great extent the course of my life has been influenced by perfectly timed gifts or personal encounters. I feel grateful for this, 
I find it interesting that a life can be so impacted by the agency of others. I also find it interesting that these events occurred at what seems in retrospect to be the most propitious times. In 1953, my uncle, Leo Levantine, gave me a Kodak Dark Room kit for my sixth birthday. He knew of my nerdy interest in chemistry and thought I would enjoy dark room work. He was right. His gift obviously changed the course of my life. I learned to develop film and make contact prints from the instruction sheet that came with the dark room kit's packets of chemicals. Here is a print I made when I was six. It's of me and my cousin Lynn, my uncle's Leo's daughter. I printed it through a heart-shaped mask I made out of cardboard. 1957. Walker Evans' work entered my life when I was given a copy of his book American Photographs by a neighbor in my apartment building for my 10th birthday. It was the first photography book I owned. Over the years I would grow into his work. More than just an influence on me, I feel something deeper, a spiritual kinship with him. That his should have been the first artistic photographic voice I heard seems almost providential. To the right is a self-portrait from the same month I received the book. Andy Warhol's invitation to the factory the day he was filming restaurant in 1965 was a turning point in my life. I would go through month-long periods of going to the factory daily. My three years at the factory were what I did instead of going to college. To my knowledge, there never was and I suppose never will be another place like the factory. While the nightly social activities may have attracted many of the people who hung out there, Andy worked every afternoon. Filmmaking was his major focus when I arrived, but he also was open to all kinds of aesthetic experiment and play. One of the earliest prototypes of a video camera was brought to the factory. Then Billy Kluver from Bell Labs came to help Andy develop his Mylard clouds. The year after I started photographing there, the Velvet Underground arrived and the activity shifted to the nightly performances at the Dome on St. Mark's Place. I helped with the lighting and got to experience the sense of freedom in anonymous creation in a communal activity. At some point, I began to become aware that because the factory was so unique and because Andy was at the center of a certain New York world, for some people at the factory, this time, this experience, was going to be the high point of their lives. I was too ambitious for that and knew it was time to move on. Andy often expressed a distanced delight in contemporary culture, a kind of quiet amazement at how things are. I realized that I shared this fascination with him. He would often involve his friends in his decision making. He would ask questions about his work. Which color do you like better? He liked having others focused on what he was doing. Where some artists prefer to create in solitude, Andy drew energy from the swirl of activity around him. His drawing people into his process opened the door to his thinking. I saw the specific choice he was making. The most important learning experience for me came from watching an artist experimenting, playing and making aesthetic decisions. I was beginning to get a taste of aesthetic intention. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.